Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board. Um, we're going to get started shortly. We're going to start um, with an executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair. I have two announcements. First, a change in our agenda today. It is um, changed on our website, but just to remind folks that we did cancel this afternoon's meeting. Um, we uh, expected to hear from Secretary Smith, but we are um, rescheduling that to next Wednesday, September 9th at 1 p.m. Uh, in addition, we closed out a special public comment period on hospital budgets on August 31st. Um, we have decided to extend that period to September 8th, Tuesday, September 8th. We accept public comment 365 days a year, um, but in order to have that, those comments considered in the hospital budget uh, voting process, we would encourage folks to get those comments in by next Tuesday, September 8th. And we will update our website accordingly, both for the public comment period and the uh, additional meeting next Wednesday. And that is all I have to report, Chair. Great, thank you, Susan. So we're gonna turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney and his team for the health system finance for um, what they've seen um, in the hospital budget hearings and just a general overview. Um, we are not expected to uh, vote on anything today, um, but basically to get a better understanding on um, what might be the easier decisions, what might be the harder decisions, and basically, um, an overview of what has transpired over the last couple of weeks in the hearing. So Patrick, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And can you see the slide deck? We can. All right, great. <clears throat> so again, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board members. Um, this morning, you're gonna hear from the staff a presentation that prepares the groundwork for the FY21 hospital budget deliberations. The staff will navigate through a system-wide view of the submitted budgets and hospital metrics and move into a preview of the first six hospitals that the staff feel the board can vote on when they are ready. And as we just heard from the chair, there will be no vote today, so this is just a preview. Um, before we begin, we'd like to offer some perspective into why we made some of the recommendations that will follow. As your finance team, we focus on the information before us at the present time. The situation to date remains extremely fluid and we have not concerned ourselves with any what ifs, what might be's, or other variables that lay outside of our control in the months ahead. Uh, the board may agree or disagree with our approach, but we believe it to be sound, <clears throat> and we have made every attempt to adhere to the budget guidance that was put forth before us in early June. We believe the hospitals have established the foundation for budget decisions by the board by unanimously presenting budgets to GMCB for a world where COVID does not have a resurgence. And I think we all believe and hope that this is true. <clears throat> By delivering such budgets, we have been given the ability to look at historical performance, fiscal year 20 excluded, engage the reasonable reasonableness of the budgets before us. We also feel that the discussion around future state CARES Act or CRF funds, as they are also known, FEMA funding or any other tranche of funds, which the hospitals may or may not receive in the future and are, make, are meant to make good on lost revenues or higher costs in fiscal year 20, should not be commingled with forward-looking operationally focused budgets. We have not considered these in our recommendations. Do the budgets before us <clears throat> have COVID-related operating costs under the moniker of the new normal? Yes, we believe they do, as they would for any new safety protocols that a regulated healthcare environment would have to absorb operationally to keep their fiscal to keep their patients and their visitors safe. <clears throat> you have a very difficult decision to make, and that is not lost on your staff. However, just like in any other year, some budgets will play out as planned and others will exceed or miss their targets. With all that I've said thus far, we also believe you should provide yourself with the flexibility to correct budgets mid-year should large disparities become present in time. Uh, revisiting budgets in six months should the need occur on a hospital by hospital basis would provide you um, the time that is probably necessary in a very fluid environment to do a look back through a partial year as the hospitals emerge from the winter and a potential um, flu season uh, that could exceed anything we've seen th thus far. Using your flexibility you provided, <clears throat> you, you are provided in the current state of emergency, we ask that you consider adopting a policy before you begin deliberations that gives you the flexibility to correct any budget decision 
that may or not, may not be working as we proceed into the current fiscal year. In addition to correcting budget decisions and guidance on NPR and change in charge, this would give you the flexibility to react to potential loan forgivenesses that some hospitals may experience, but is too far out for accurate consideration at this time. The staff feel that by doing so, you can mitigate the cost to ratepayers. You can ensure that one year from now, you are making more accurate decisions on fiscal 22, NPR and change in charge, which is to the benefit of the hospitals so that they don't feel the pinch of the board looking back with a year's time behind them. Finally, you can show the board's agility to adapting to changing events in a very difficult time, just as you did for our state's hospitals by postponing and then overhauling this year's regulatory processes so that our healthcare providers could focus their resources on what they do best. We do think that the board owes that to themselves, that flexibility at a time when your decisions in the next two weeks are nearly impossible to make accurately. So our recommendations this year try to encompass all of that. We've tried to give a lot of thought to it. and you've asked us to help provide you some guidance. So that's what we've tried to do here. And with that, I will move into our slide deck. And for the record, uh, my name is Patrick Rooney. I'm the Director of uh, Health Systems Finance Team. And with me, presenting with me today is Lori Perry, our um, Analytics or Analysis Director. <clears throat> okay, what is going on here? That's not the one I want to share. Can you see my screen now? I think I've got the right one up. Yes, we can see with Gifford Medical. Nope, You're that is not it. That's You're showing not slide it. 32. Nope, that's not it. I'm sorry. Is this the right that... presentation, Patrick? You just have to start at the beginning. No, that's not what I want. Patrick, the slide deck you have up is the 141 slide one, not the abbreviated one. Okay, can you see this? Not yet. At least I can't. Can anybody see it? Nothing? Nothing. Okay, let's try this again, sorry. And we're back to the Gifford Medical Center slide. Yeah. Oh, now it's gone again. Can you see this? Not yet. Hold on a second. I think I'm having some internet problems here. Could somebody else share the slides maybe in the, on the team and then you could walk through them? Can you see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes. Okay. It looks to be the there right There it one. is. All right, I've got it now. I apologize for all of that. Okay. <clears throat> so to begin, we put up some of the deliberation uh, public comments that we received. We kept them uh, relatively vague. Some of these were expressed verbally during the hearings, while others were sent to the Green Mountain Care Board in a written format. Uh, we did feel that we should post these in some sort of context into this slide deck for consideration as we move through the budget deliberations. Um, so staff considerations. <clears throat> um, we've looked at several items as we've moved through these hospitals and our in-depth discussions that have occurred uh, after the hearings on every day and prior to hearings. Um, so the hospital's overall financial health, operating margins and key financial indicators, potential financial uncertainty due to COVID, 
hospitals capital and infrastructure needs. We've heard that there's been some postponement, yet some hospitals are uh, continuing to move forward with plans that they put a hiatus on, um, but they are gearing back up to complete some of those projects. Uh, participation in the all payer model. Um, we've had some changes there in the last couple of weeks, and we will continue to update uh, those slides as we proceed through these deliberations and decisions over the next couple of weeks as necessary. Um, the impact of change in charge on commercial ratepayers, provider transfer and accounting adjustments and adequately justified requests, budget guidance on MPR and FPP growth rates, adequately justified requests, hospital specific risks and opportunities, as well as some additional topics around cost savings initiatives, participation in delivery system reform, leadership turnover, workforce and travelers, utilization, and some of the other revenues that have come into play around replacement funds. Here is a system-wide look collectively at all of the um, hospitals in our system. You can see <clears throat> on slide five here, uh, the total NPR and FPP budget to budget is 3.3% and projection to budget is 15.7%. Um, those high project 20 projection to 21 budget figures are going to be common throughout as um, fiscal year 20 has obviously been impacted by the uh, cessation of electives for a couple of months back in the early and late spring. So we will see some double digit figures there from projection to budget across all hospitals. Uh, operating expenses are looking at a 5.3% increase budget to budget and 6.3% increase projection to budget. Overall, the system it has submitted an operating margin of 1.8% and a total margin of 3%. Slide six uh, provides the, <coughs> uh, the board and the public with a look at uh, change in charges from fiscal year 2016 to 2021. Um, that have been approved from 2016 to 2020, and those submitted for 2021 included, including a COVID component. Um, the as submitted, the weighted average for the system is 6.8%. Again, that's a weighted average. So the larger the gross revenues associated with these change in charges, um, the more weight it holds on that overall average. So UVM being almost 50% of the system um, certainly drives that weighted average up significantly with an 8%. Um, requested change in charge percentage. Slide seven, you've seen this from a few hospitals, either in this format or in varying formats, but the message is the same. Uh, the five-year average for approved change in charges by hospital, ranging from Gifford uh, at the top from 2016 to 2020, averaging 4.5%, all the way down to Copley, averaging a 0.6% rate increase over the last five years on average. <clears throat> Uh, net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments from fiscal 19 actuals through the 2021 budget as submitted in the 2021 budget. You will see on slide eight at the very bottom in fiscal year 2020 projections, a quite a dip in revenue from the other columns on this page, and then a return to uh, higher revenue figures in 2021 budget. Uh, as we stated in our opening remarks, these budgets unanimously were submitted um, to not consider a resurgence in COVID. Uh, so business as usual type of budgets were submitted, <clears throat> but you can follow the trends and see the implications of COVID on fiscal year 2020 projections. Uh, slide nine, here are the variances between um, fiscal 19 and the budget 2021 and the third column over fiscal year 20 budget to FY 2021 budget. You will see those hospitals who are budgeting up for their net patient revenue and fixed perspective payment and those who are budgeting down in red. We made a point to highlight the hospitals who are actually budgeting NPR revenues down uh, in the coming year from their 2020 budget. Um, again, <clears throat> the projection to budget 2020 to 2021, you will see some very large uh, variances there as 2020 revenues were suppressed by the onset of COVID. Moving to slide 10, uh, we wanted to show fixed perspective payments as a percentage of NPR. The all payer model continues to move along in the state and we continue to track these types of figures. We wanted to focus solely on 21 and not provide any historical context to this because 
2020 is certainly its own unique year, and we wouldn't want to uh, make it appear that um, FPP revenues were a larger portion of NPR um, in 2020, nor would we want to show in 2021 that um, maybe compared to 2020, they would appear to be less of a percentage of NPR just by the nature of the fact that NPR was suppressed in 2020. So we're keeping it strictly to this year's budget as a percentage of NPR to tell the true story of where um, fixed perspective payments reside as a portion of total NPR FPP. <clears throat> Slide 11, we've dug out total operating revenues. You will see on the far right in the very bottom for all hospitals that fiscal year 2021 budget total operating revenues are set to surpass $3 billion as submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, total operating revenues also consider items like 340B, cafeteria, et cetera, um, that aren't um, specifically derived from direct patient care like net patient revenue or fixed perspective payments. So this is all in operating revenues of Vermont's 14 hospitals. On slide 12, <clears throat> uh, we're recording COVID funds reported another operating revenue for fiscal year 20 and 2021. Um, most of the hospitals are forecasting the complete usage of the relief funds that they've received thus far um, by the end of fiscal year 2022. We have a couple of hospitals who are forecasting potential usage for the remainder of their funds moving into the first part of their 2021 fiscal year. Um, some hospitals did not record uh, some of the funds that they still hold simply for the fact that uh, they do not know if they will use them or not. So the funds you see in 2021 are hospitals that do plan to utilize the remainder of some of their funds to cover COVID related costs in the first part of their upcoming fiscal year. But again, we have several hospitals on here who still have money left over, um, but those sums are relatively high and they are simply not sure if they will be able to use that in time. So they have not considered it um, to be realized on their income statement for their 2021 budget. <clears throat> on slide 13, we uh, put together a similar slide when we presented our fiscal year end 19 actuals report back in, I believe it was February. And the focus on and reliance on other operating revenues, specifically 340B and its importance to the hospitals. And we can see that over the last few years, um, that importance has grown as a proportion of their uh, total operating revenues. And we wanted to keep that, uh, that graph in mind because it is, it is a fact of their, of their existence that these rev they do depend on these revenues to make um, at least a portion of their bottom line. And that reliance is growing and we are now up to about 9% across the system. And of course, in 2020, we've carved out um, realized COVID funding um, through the 2020 projections. So just to continue that, that narrative as we work through um, our processes, uh, beginning with the budgets and through the actuals for next year. <clears throat> Operating expenses. <clears throat> Slide 14. Fiscal year 2021 budget operating expenses are uh, much like total operating revenues are uh, expected to surpass $3 billion as submitted. Um, the approved budgets for last year were 2.86. So we're seeing uh, a, a quite an uptick, about a $160 million uptick in operating expenses uh, moving forward. Again, the most of the weight of that is the University of Vermont Medical Center, just given their size. <clears throat> And that, of course, drives the entire system's um, fiscal year 21 expenses over the $3 billion mark as submitted. Operating expense growth, these are the um, percentage growth. We'll see that, <clears throat> um, again, a couple of the network hospitals are um, looking projection to budget to grow operating expenses. Central Vermont 7.5%, UVM 8.8%. Um, we've got a couple hospitals in Northwestern and Rutland Regional where they're actually projecting neutral or below on, on some of their operating expenses. Um, but for the most part, the system is, is moving between um, 2 and 6.5% across the board. <clears throat> operating margins, 
Um, as you can see on the far left column on slide 16, we all know the plight of the hospitals at the end of uh, fiscal year 2019, and then the projections for this year given COVID. Um, largely, <clears throat> um, the system as a whole has come out, I believe, better than any of us would have anticipated um, sitting here back in early April. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the um, taxpayers of the United States ponying up to assist their healthcare systems with covering the cost of providing care and covering the lost revenues that um, hospitals had to endure as they cared for and responded to the COVID crisis. Um, the negative $5 million loss is not optimal by any stretch of the imagination, but when we look back at what could have been in April and May, it's probably a pretty good picture. Uh, moving forward into 2021 budget, we see the hope that these margins will rebound and across the entire system. Um, hospitals as submitted <clears throat> are budgeting a combined $56.5 million operating margin, and that varies everything from Grace Cottage's break even uh, to UVM's $40.3 million uh, operating margin as submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board. Operating margin percentages on those dollars. Um, again, <clears throat> the story is very similar uh, to the prior page. It's just in uh, percentages. So the we have several that are budgeting very, very low under one for 2021. And we have others who are exceeding um, two and one that exceeds uh, four and a half percent operating margin for the coming year as submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board. Days cash on hand, one of the um, financial metrics that everybody loves. Um, <clears throat> this is without COVID relief funds. So these are um, these are the days cash on hand that these hospitals um, have provided us for fiscal year 2020 projections and fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, you can see the um, differences in some of these hospitals due to some of the losses that they've incurred or um, some capital improvements that they've made, most likely very limited to date. Um, so the situation uh, continues to be pretty fluid. We've also noted, of course, that Southwestern Vermont's parent company holds most of the day's cash on hand in that event. We always asterisk that so that it doesn't appear like they are in any sort of uh, dire financial trouble. Um, again, we carved out the COVID money. These numbers are much, much larger with some of the COVID dollars that still exist uh, regarding individual hospitals. And we just wanted to provide a um, picture as we have in the past of where these hospitals reside with days cash on hand. Moving to slide 19, uh, age of plant. We did not ask for age of plant in fiscal year 2021. Some hospitals uh, did provide it. Um, for the most part, the average age of plant does not shift um, in any extremes. Uh, it, it can in certain events where um, assets are depreciated and removed from balance sheets, but for the most part, it just kind of ticks up and ticks down as as uh, items are added and and um, depreciated on balance sheets. So we just wanted to provide this perspective. It is important um, in relation to days cash on hand, the age of some of these organizations, their physical plant. Uh, we have several that are in excess of 18 years old and a few that are over 20 years old. Um, and the time is coming very soon for um, some of those days cash on hand to be put into making um, physical improvements to those organizations, whether it be efficiencies or energy savings or simply overhauling um, certain departments to meet new protocols set forth by CMS or the new challenges that they face in providing healthcare to patients on a daily basis. So a few of these organizations will be using some of those days cash on hand to make improvements in the near future when the situation that we're currently in begins to stabilize further. <clears throat> uh, ACO plan participation, as I alluded to at the outset, this is still uh, pretty fluid right now. In our guidance, we had uh, asked the hospitals to begin to submit information on September 1st around participation. Uh, we've marked out through the hospital presentations those that we believe are committed to next year, even though contracts have yet to be signed. So this is something that we will continue to monitor and update throughout this process as matters become more apparent to us <clears throat> at the Green Mountain Care Board. 
hospital benefit plan participation in the ACO. This was the question that came up um, back in May, and we gathered this information from the hospital. So as you can see, we only have uh, three hospitals whose um, insurance plans participate and attribute lives to the ACO as of this time. And again, should this change in the coming weeks, we will certainly update this slide for accuracy. <clears throat> this is a perspective we wanted to provide the board um, pretty much across the hospital submissions. They base their budgets off of um, their year to date February actuals, which is five months of their 2020 fiscal year. And the reason this is important is because this is what this is kind of the demarcation point between pre COVID and post COVID um, hospital finances. So you will see that the budget to actual variance in column three on slide 22, you can see where these hospitals were tracking as of the end of February. And system wide, the hospitals were budget to actual, they were off 1.6%. And that varies by hospital, but that is the average um, budget to actual variance. And this is the perspective we provided the board uh, back in our <coughs> presentation on May financials to give some context around how these hospitals were performing through almost 50% of their fiscal year before the onset of COVID. And we hope that um, at least in part, you will look at this and consider this as, um, in your decisions around um, reasonableness for 2021 budgets. <clears throat> we also asked this year in the budget guidance to provide to us the um, revenue replacement funding sources and dollars that each hospital had received as of the budget submissions to us. And there will be some disparities and these numbers because we are um, gathering these figures uh, ongoing and some of this information is very, very fluid. I don't know if anybody has a true handle on the dollars that have um, come and gone and we will make sure we round that out in the coming year as things become more clear. But this is there to provide a picture of which sources are grant sources and are not to be paid back and which which are um, largely loans or advances that are either will undergo reclamation by payers or are are not we're not, they're not positive if they will pay them back or not. Um, the SBA PPP loans are probably the primary example of that. There is a forgiveness program that hospitals can take part in, but given the staggered nature, nature of how SBA rolled out some of those paycheck protection programs when the program became overloaded and had to be refunded, some of the repayment is not gonna be um, underway until later this calendar year. Um, and even still, some of that remains unknown. So this is just to provide a snapshot, our best um, foot forward in what um, the hospitals have received uh, as a means to um, plug that cash flow gap that they were they would have experienced uh, with the loss of their um, elective revenue. <clears throat> so um, comply it with budget guidance. We looked at this from a budget to budget perspective on 3.5% as the board set forth in the guidance um, the hospitals on the left came in under the 3.5% NPR growth rate. The hospitals on the right did not. However, you will see we've caveated a couple of these in that um, some of them have a COVID rate that pushes them over into quote unquote non-compliant status. Um, and Northeastern has a combination of a particular um, drug that pushes them over and their COVID rate. Um, and on several instances here, other than that, they would have fallen into what we consider quote unquote compliant. I wouldn't hold uh, us to those that terminology. Um, that's just how we decided to uh, separate some of these hospitals out. Uh, as I just alluded to, the excluding COVID change in charge, um, we've taken their NPR request and backed out the value of their COVID related change in charge to arrive at what their NPR FPP request would be in 2021 without that ask. And the only hospital who um, whose NPR growth budget to budget comes in over the 3.5% uh, growth ceiling would be Brattleboro, Manascotney, Northeastern and Northwestern all come under that. So again, the compliant and non-compliant is a very loose term, um, but that was a um, 
terminology we, we have used in the past and wanted to continue with that, um, that terminology, but again, very loose. So here's a look at what those budget to budget growth would look like without a COVID component. <clears throat> Uh, this year, we also wanted to include um, standard budget order conditions. This comes from the budget orders. We broke it down into more simple terms. Um, last year, um, the board, when making motion, would say, and you know, conditions to other standard budget order conditions. So we wanted to make sure that um, when we're talking about that this year, if it comes up, this is what we're talking about. So this is out there and transparent for uh, the board and the public to see uh, when the board begins to talk about that. So we wanted to make sure that that was part of this budget as well. So that concludes the system wide overlook. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if you if you want to have some dialogue about what we've just said, or would you like Lori and I to begin to move into a preview of um, the individual hospitals? You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay, I was going to say um, let's let's open it up to board members for any questions on the uh, first part of the presentation at this point, and uh, then we can move forward. So, okay. um, board members, questions, comments. Uh, it's Maureen. I have a few. Um, just a couple of questions, I guess, on, on some of the slides. Uh, when we look at, um, I guess, first a comment on the compliance non-compliance on page 24 um, just to also set the stage that we had talked about you know looking at kind of a two-year view and if hospitals maintained within that three and a half percent growth from 2019 to 20 to 21 that you know we would look at that from an enforcement purposes as being in compliance so i I know you have done a slide on that, Patrick, or you've looked at that, and I believe we can say, you know, none of the hospitals exceed the two-year three and a half percent. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, which just means for people listening that the the amount they're they're off in 2020 um, is being somewhat made up in 21, but not enough to push them over the limit. So I, I just wanted to just just to kind of ward off any any you know anything from the hospitals uh, when we look at that non-compliant. Um, when you look at the day's cash, uh, do we know or can we figure out how much is funded through potentially investments and things like that? Because I know some hospitals liquidated some assets which may be um you know keeping their keeping them afloat on the day's cash on hand but it's um they, they may have lower investments now so don't know if we know which hospitals did that i know specifically some had talked about that um off the top of my head i know of two that is all um other than that, no, I can't say with any certainty that I know of any others that that did use some of their investments at the outset of COVID to um, fund cash flow when federal funding was very uncertain. I only know of two that did that. Okay. And then another potential follow up, and I'm not sure if you can get this information, but when you look at the year over year change, the 15.3% from the 20 projection to the 21 budget request, um, is there a way to calculate how much of that is rate versus utilization or mix? I will have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, and another one, and I'm not sure we can get this either, but when we talk about the other operating revenue, um, about as of not at 9%, you know, what the expenses related to that are. You know, we get a lot of messages about how much 340B, et cetera, is contributing to the bottom line, but we usually don't have clarity on how much of that is falling to um, to the bottom line relative to, um, I think it was really the other operating revenue. <clears throat> Your slide that had the 9%. It would be good to understand how much of that falls to the bottom line. 
we do have the increasing reliance on the top line and there's an, probably even more so increasing reliance on the bottom line, but you know, understanding what that is would be, would be good. Um, and that's all I have. Tom, were you starting to say something? I saw blue, blue around your, uh, um, no, well, I, at some point, but, um, uh, I, I, I guess, I guess my observations at this point are an interest is at the kind of macro level. Um, and, you know, I feel very comfortable and, uh, and this has to do, I think with alignment, I feel very comfortable with what we did, you know, with the QHP, um, insurance rates, because if you take those two in, you know, for MVP and um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and add them together and divide by two, you know, we're in at below three and a half percent. And, uh, you know, for me, that uh, three and a half percent is kind of the sustainability guiding star, um, you know, uh, which is, I, I think, important. Um, and budget to budget, um, as Patrick showed us, uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, NPR, it's in at 3.3%, um, which is, again, kind of consistent with that 3.5% uh, guideline. But what worries me about that is how skewed it is. Um, and uh, so if you take out the UVMMC from the uh, uh, re um, <clears throat> re in requested increase in NPR, which is for them, $76.8 million. The remainder is nine tenths of 1% for the other 13 hospitals. And so I'm just interested as to whether or not that skewing makes sense because of the a portion of with UVM getting, you know, asking for 85.6% is well beyond their um, normal run rate of NPR, which is, I think, around, you know, 49 to 50%. So, um, so I'm interested in that. Um, I'm also kind of interested, this might not be the right form, but at some point um, I'm interested in that if we are looking at insurance rates going up three, um, you know, three, three point four, three point five 3.4, 3.5%, you know, does that squeeze the non-hospital providers? And so, and you know, I'll, I'll be looking as we go through this to, um, you know, make sure that, that we don't, um, have an unintended consequence of of having the independent non-hospital providers get squeezed because the hospitals, you know, kind of draw the uh, the commercial attention. Um, and I'm also, I think, finally, just interested. There's, you know, in in our statute for budget review, there is um, section. 18 VSA 9456, and one of them um, is paragraph eight. And that says that the board shall consider the extent to which costs incurred by the hospital in connection with services provided to Medicaid beneficiaries are being charged to non-Medicaid health benefit plans and other non-Medicaid payers. And there's another uh, paragraph nine that uh, kind of parallels that interest. And, you know, for me, I go back to, um, you know, worried that the cost shift um, is kind of a fatal flaw in our hospital funding system. I worry that it siphons off successes that we might have from investments in population health. Um, and I also look at it in terms of the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the state Medicaid program has had some very good years. Um, their caseload has gone from, Medicaid caseload has gone from 151,000 in 2017 down to 133,000 in 2020. Um, they just reported year-end 2020 amounts, and uh, they were the Medicaid program overall was to the good at the end of the fiscal year by $34 million. And so, in my experience, you know, when we got into the mid '90s and and things were going well, and we were watching caseloads drop, then we had some capacity to expand, and we did VHAP. And I'm worried here that we were going through a very positive period. And DIVA, like they said a couple of weeks ago, are flatlining uh, their rates. And I think that hurts a certain segment of hospitals that are more dependent on Medicaid than others. 
um, but it's also missing an opportunity to rebalance um, the system in a way that is 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 more equitable. So those are just a, a couple of thoughts that I have that um, as we go through this, um, I'm you know I'm going to you my my interest is not so much getting into the detail of hospital budgets. We have that sustainability process coming before us, but my interests are more in the macro balancing of the system uh, between in, you know insurance carriers, um, the hospitals relative to their their size of the total ho you know hospital population, and um, trying to at least we we can't order the state to fund Medicaid, but there might be some actions uh, that we can take to put it on the table that the Green Mountain Care Board, at least, is not an enabler of the cost shift and um, and let others do uh, do what they will. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Jess, Jess or Robin, do you have any comments or questions? I have a couple questions, but I don't know. Robin, do you want to go first? No, you go ahead. OK, mine are probably quick. Um, this is related to Patrick. This is related to Maureen's point about the two year look at the hospitals. I'm wondering if it's possible. It sounds like maybe you already have a chart that wasn't in this deck, but that looks at for each hospital, the two year average NPR 19 actual to 20 projected and then 20 projected to 21 budget. That would just help kind of look at that help us see what you know the two-year um, NPR performance looks like. Do you have that? Yes. Test? Is that something you I can... do? I, okay, can, I can update the slide deck with that. That would be wonderful. Okay. Thank you. And then can you just go to slide six for a second? Perfect. I just had a quick question about when you do the estimated weighted average for all hospitals for the 2021 submitted. The 6.8. Um, how are you dealing with the network hospitals, like a porter? Are you giving them a zero, or are you giving them a 5.8 in that calculation? Laura, you want to jump in on that one? In that one, I believe I'm giving them a zero. Let me double check. Well, while you're it's double checking, up, it's against it is against gross revenue from the previous year. OK. But it might just be helpful for us to understand what's the average weighted average effective commercial rate this year, which would obviously unfortunately be higher than that if we are including a 5.8 instead of a zero and an 8.5 instead of a six. So just to thank you. We'll follow up with you. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, are there, do you, do you have a sense, and I've been trying to keep track, but of all of the follow-up questions from the from the board during the hearings, are we, are we who, are there still outstanding hospitals that we haven't heard from? I, I've got a lot of uh, email yesterday. It looked like we got five or six, but I'm not sure if I've missed. Who's, who do we still have outstanding questions from? Again, I'll, still Lori's been tracking that. Right. We still have outstanding. I believe we just barely received UVM late last night. Okay. Yes. And um, I'm not sure. I would have to double check for you, but okay. we, you'll but be getting still... the rest of them. The rest of them, if we received them, you'll be receiving them this afternoon. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just felt like there were some outstanding questions still out there, and it sounds like they're coming in. Uh, and then my last uh, point, just Patrick, I really liked your idea with all the uncertainty this year. I really liked your recommendation to allow the board to do a mid-year just assessment. Um, and I'm wondering, do we need to have that as part of the budget, like a standard budget order on that uh, slide that you had with the standard budget order conditions? Do we just add that as a standard budget order condition that the board reserves the right to do a mid-year assessment in this particular year of so much uncertainty? I would think so, but I would, of course, defer to our general counsel on that question just so I don't get myself into any trouble. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure if Mike is on or not, if that's something he'd be willing to weigh in on now or if he needs to give that some thought. Okay, yeah, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm on. Jess, could you repeat the question? I was. Okay. Kinda... Sure. I just, I, you know, I appreciated Patrick's rec Patrick and team's recommendation about given all the uncertainty this year, um, allowing the board to do a mid-year check-in reassessment if needed. Uh, you know, given what might happen with COVID or new tranches of money or who knows what. So I'm wondering if that needs to just be a standard that we add to this year's budget orders or how we go about making sure part of this process. What, what, whether that's something you want to do um, is, a, is a board question. Legally, yes, I think you could do that. I think the question that we need to think about and talk about is, <clears throat> A check-in to to do what? Like if if a hospital is over trending over, uh, you have an enforcement policy that basically says you're going to deal with it in the FY22 budget process. And is is that still the case? Is this just a a look, or is it potentially coupled with some sort of enforcement action? So, um, but I'll think about it some more and. and in anticipation of uh, the deliberations, I think. I mean, it could be it could be a, a mid-year course correction, whether they're over or they're under, right? And so, I think it's the idea being that, given all the uncertainty, um, waiting until the following year to make a course correction might be too late. So, for some hospitals, so that was, I think, the spirit of what patrick was suggesting am i right spirit am i right patrick you you nailed it and you can call me spirit it's okay <laughs> okay that yeah i think me, if you sorry. want to look at the enforcement policy that you guys adopted uh with the budget guidance okay thank you that's right um we did have certain language in there about enforcement for 20 right so this is looking forward okay thank you Okay, Robin. Um, I think pretty much all my questions have been answered. I was I was going to follow up as just just did on on what for a little more specificity specificity about what Patrick and team were thinking, but I think it makes sense to go back to the enforcement policy because we did have quite a discussion about how to handle that um, in March, which feels like it was at least two years ago, <laughs> even though it was not. <laughs> um, and other than that, I think uh, all my questions have been answered. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. Patrick, you might as well proceed with the, the next portion of the deck. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, so now Lori and I are going to toggle back and forth on the six hospitals that we have prepared today. And <clears throat> I will transition over to her as we move into the next and then back and forth and back and forth we will go. Uh, so the first one we have up here is Gifford Medical Center. Um, their FY21 request over their FY20 budget is uh, a negative 0.6%, um, which is well below the 3.5% growth ceiling set forth by the board. Uh, you can see their budget to projection variance is negative 11%. There were times in years past where that would have um, sent off a red flag to us, but given what yeah. has occurred, that's kind of a moot point this year. Um, their justification was uh, a continued diligence in their improvement plan, their extensive cost savings program that they've undertaken. Um, they do have to make some future renovations for aging plant, um, some capital yeah. expenditures. They're not going to do anything major this year. It's it's more going to be upkeep and replacement and stuff like that. Um, their ongoing uh, efforts to ensure access to their rural community and working to get their volumes back. They do expect their volumes to uh, return to pre-COVID levels. So <clears throat> in the past, this chart here would have provided a little bit more context on their year, but uh, given what's occurred, um, we can see that it's kind of out of whack. They had a very, very down NPR FPP in their third quarter, yet their operating margin um, came roaring back. Uh, we we know that is largely due to um, the booking and realization of uh, the relief funds in other operating fund funding. So we normally wouldn't see that type of trend where revenues are down, yet margin improves. Um, so that's just to show that um, things are a little out of whack this year. 
Um, this is one of the charts that we have focused on, as I said, by submitting budgets, and rightly so, um, that do not consider a resurgence of COVID because of all the variables and the impossible nature of having to budget to all of those. Um, we took a good look at some of these uh, historical performance indicators around how do they budget, where do they come in in actualities, and where has their margin been. Um, and over the years here, Gifford has um, has been budgeting and, and not quite getting to where they were, and they've recognized that, um, and the board has recognized that. Um, so every year they're, they're doing a little bit better on that. Um, aspirational budgeting is not something that they are um, continuing to achieve. They are working to get um, volumes back overall. Um, but the real story about this, and Mr. Chair, I think you've put it well a couple of times, is that this hospital was uh, in some serious financial trouble just a couple of years ago. And, and uh, Dan Bennett and his organization have done a excellent job of pulling themselves out of that situation. And we can see last year they did lose money, but they improved their bottom line by $5 million. Um, that is an organizational wide effort to attain that type of change. So they've really done an excellent job of, of writing the, the hospital up there. And um, they are looking to have a profit this year. They were profitable um, going into COVID. Uh, that was one of the hospitals that we were seeing some of their changes actually taking a real time effect moving into the, the world of COVID. And then next year, they're they're hoping to attain almost a, a $1 million operating margin. So we we did look at that <clears throat> um, pretty significantly, that historical performance. Um, overall, this is a breakdown of charges and how they hope to apply them across hospital inpatient, outpatient, and uh, professional I'm services. Sorry, I'm sorry. This is the court reporter. I think I missed a couple words there. You said overall, that is a breakdown. Oh, sorry. Overall on slide 30 here, we have a breakdown of their change in charge. We have the dollar value of NPR impact on change change in charge and uh, the dollar value of 1% change in charge. And as you can see, they plan to apply their overall change in charge of 4% equally across hospital inpatient and outpatient gross charges and professional and specialty care services. <clears throat> Uh, across the board, they've made assumptions for increases in commercial, Medicaid, and Medicare. And their average five-year change in charge at the bottom of slide 30 has been 4.5%. And if uh, anyone recalls back to the system-wide effort, they have been from fiscal year 2016 to 2020, they've been at the top of the pyramid uh, as far as average change in charge is concerned. We also wanted to provide uh, a system wide or a, a hospital specific look at their um, NPR FPP payer mix. These are and their um, NPR FPP as a percentage of gross revenue. Uh, this is a look that we began to provide in our fiscal year end 2019 report, and it was um, met with appreciation by um, visual learners, I guess I'd say, um, that, that shows you the <clears throat> um, shift away from. Um, commercial, self-pay, and other to uh, Medicare. And um, as that goes, the margins on commercial um, can erode unless commercial rates are increased. This is the, the cost shift that um, Tom was talking about. So, But we also wanted to provide for the board a look at um, how much of their uh, NPR FPP um, do they collect from their gross revenue. And as we can see, as they budgeted, that is going down to uh, 43%. So <clears throat> to give a preview of our recommendation and Robin, we've we've included suggested motion language this year on, on, on all these hospitals and we intend to continue that um, so that you don't have to ad lib on the fly. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were covering you in that respect. Um, so <clears throat> uh, as stated, their NPR FPP request of negative uh, 6% is within the budget to budget growth rate of 3.5%. We would approve that as submitted. That seems uh, conservatively optimistic. Moving into the next year, their change in charge of 4% would also be approved as submitted. That is a half percentage point below their five year average. Um, and of course, an additional recommendation in order to monitor the 
fluidity of the situation moving into next year, we would want continued timely submission of monthly financials to monitor their financial health. So um, in sum, um, they've recovered from years past. Their commercial ask is lower than their five-year average. Their budget to budget budget growth is trying to get back to where they would have been for 20. We think that's an appropriate um, look forward for a hospital. Um, as of February, they were exceeding their budget by about 6%. Um, again, that is um, you know, only five months, so we wanted to look back at that, um, that history of theirs. Uh, they have utilized cost control measures. That was one of the asks of the board from a couple of years ago. They have delivered in that. Um, their budgeting has become less aspirational. And with average age of plant in excess of 20 years, they're going to need to continue to put cash in the bank so that they can make those appropriate uh, investments moving forward. And again, um, they're probably planning a couple of years out now to make some of those just given the situation on the ground uh, right near right now. But um, they do need to begin um, executing on some of those capital improvement plans. So we would approve this budget as submitted. And as you can see, again, we've set motion language forth there. Um, should the board choose to accept that. Um, so with that, we will, I will turn it over to Lori and Southwestern Medical Center. Southwestern Medical Center, as you can see on this slide, was negative 13.1% below their budget when they projected 20. And they are currently a negative 3% lower than their 20 budget for the 21 budget. And they are requesting a 3.5% change in charge. Uh, we would recommend to approve this uh, budget because they are well below the 3.5% growth rate ceiling. And this hospital's volumes are back pre-COVID based on their 12 month runway. And um, they have budgeted down in a couple areas. And uh, as you've seen in previous slides, their average age of plant is one of the oldest in the state. They're trying to keep up with their improvements. They've also done an um, emergency department renovation that they're trying to do. And um, so a lot of their day's cash on hand that you're seeing in their parent will be going towards this aging plant. Next slide, please, 34. And their operating performance, they've been um, trying to be pretty steady through the fiscal year 20, but even though they had COVID and um, their operating margins were basically back in line with the, pre, um, the COVID relief funds in their third quarter. And they hopefully that they will be just about breaking even on their fourth quarter. Next slide, please. And for the Southwestern's historical operating performance from 2015 through 2021, they have basically been about budget. They are a strong budget management organization and they're not usually very far off on their actuals to budget. And their operating margins, they've been doing very well with their operating margins through the years. Um, we, this is a, we think a strong performing hospital. Um, slide 36, please. Uh, Southwestern's change in charge. Again, they're asking for 3.5% change in charge. This is equal to um, 3 million of their NPR due to the change in charge. And they're expecting to increase their inpatient and outpatient change in charge by 5%, but they're not increasing professional services at all. And most of the change in charge is related to their commercial payer. Um, they have averaged an approved um, change in charge rate of 3.2% through the last five years. Next slide, please. And their payer mix, they um, started out in 2019 at 40% Medicare, 12% Medicaid, and 48% commercial. 
They're budgeting 39% for 21 for Medicare, 11% for Medicaid, and 50% for um, commercial. And this hospital's uh, NPR to gross revenue started out in 2019 at 45%, and now it's 53% of gross revenues. Next slide. 43%. 43%. And staff recommends that you approve this budget because their NPR FPP request of negative 3% is well below the 3.5% uh, growth ceiling. And their change in charge is, well, a, um, average of most everybody else. And we, um, we want them to continue to submit monthly financials to the Green Mountain Care Board. This hospital, um, continues to have performance service agreements with Dartmouth, they call it the PSAs, and they're expecting to budget two fewer FTEs with this contract. They're a heavy user of telehealth and will continue to use telehealth, but they have the uncertainty of the reimbursement for telehealth in their budget. They're utilizing national recognized benchmarks for their staff, and their February 2020 performance was 5% below budget. Their management is budgeting down in some areas in 21 to help offset this. And then they are planning to continue with the ACO in all pairs. And they did not have any service line adjustments planned for 2021. And we feel this hospital has a strong history of budget management. And we encourage the board to approve this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Okay, next up is North Country Hospital. <clears throat> Again, you'll see kind of a theme here. Uh, this hospital's 2021 request is um, budgeting down from their fiscal year 2020 budget. Uh, again, the budget to projection variance is in double digits given the current situation. Um, and that 1.1% negative request is less than 3.5% growth rate. They're looking for a 3.6% change in charge. Um, North Country's justification was ongoing adaptive active management culture. Um, their volume assumptions as of February uh, are with minimal COVID impact for this budget. They do need to generate healthy margins for reinvestment in the organization. And um, this hospital, along with the next one, Northeastern, um, has made some, some service line changes. Uh, I'd say Probably on the top of that would be they have divested from the uh, Derby Green nursing home in the last year. There were conversations in the budget last year about um, the losses that North Country was incurring from that nursing home. Um, but more importantly, the um, work, collaborative work that they're doing with other area hospitals around neurology, cardiology, and ophthalmology, and recognizing that um, the community need may not quite be there for them. So there's opportunities to be had in teaming up with other hospitals um, to provide those services. Um, as you'll see here, um, they did uh, close the neurology. There wasn't enough volume to justify maintaining that practice. But in regard to card cardiology and ophthalmology, partnering with uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock to reduce some of those wait times and with op ophthalmology, um, they're recruiting they're not sure of uh, their ability to land an ophthalmologist, so they're exploring a collaborate, collaborative effort with NVRH, who has a strong ophthalmology program. Um, this does fall in line with uh, some of the efforts by the Green Mountain Care Board to see um, some collaboration across hospitals to meet the challenges of delivering these services in rural areas. And North Country is, is making a, a sincere effort to, to move that forward. Again, you'll see um, in their quarterly performance, um, <clears throat> especially quarter three, overall NPR FPP down, operating margins up. That is a similar trend that we're going to see. Um, but regardless, they are um, planning to end the year in positive operating territory for fiscal year 2020. Um, and that dovetails into some of their historical performance. Again, if you look at those operating margins from 2017 and 2018, um, it was not looking so great for North Country Hospital. However, 
Um, they had a rough start in 2019, but rebounded to produce a 1.9% operating margin um, at $1.7 million. They're projecting to end this year in positive territory and hoping to continue that effort and really make it a trend moving forward into 2021. So they've had some struggles, uh, but it seems that um, Brian and company and new leadership are are beginning to uh, transform this hospital into a positive operating entity. And um, they're budgeting to continue that work moving forward. Again, uh, the slide 42 breakdown of the overall change in charge, it is 3.6%. <clears throat> the NPR impact of that is 2.2 million. 1% of that is $526,000. They are going to apply um, 4.3% across inpatient, outpatient, and physician outpatient. Um, to name a few, the uh, the overall uh, impact of NPR is largely attributed to commercial with a portion of it, $782,000 to Medicare. And again, their 2020 request is uh, NPR decrease of 886,000 uh, and the change in charge adds 2.2 million to that. Their five-year average um, of 4.2% is higher than their request for this year overall. And again, the payer mix, um, we saw Southwestern was relatively stable. We're actually seeing commercial um, payer mix tick up uh, year over year, 29, or I shouldn't say year over year, I would say from 29 actuals through budget and 20 projection to 2021 budget um, and Medicare uh, receding with Medicaid fluctuating overall. Their MPR FPV as a percentage of gross revenues has declined about 2%. Um, from 2019 actual to 2021 budget. <clears throat> so as far as our recommendation is concerned, the one point, negative 1.1% 1 .1 is well within the 3.5% ceiling that the board has set forth in guidance. We would approve that as submitted. The change in charge of 3.6% is about 0.7% underneath their 0.6% underneath their historical average. We would like to see continued timely submissions. That will be something we uh, have throughout. Um, as of February, they were exceed, they were 2.7% uh, below their budget as of February. We do not know the seasonality of the hospital could contribute to that. It might not. They may have just been missing their budget. Um, however, they are projected to recover by the end of 2020 all of their losses that they incurred in 2017 and 2018. And that's, that's a pretty impressive feat. Um, as we stated before, they have made some service line adjustments and are collaborating with other area hospitals to uh, meet the challenges of providing specialty services in rural areas. Um, and that continued and growing collaboration, uh, we believe is in alignment with um, GMCB's values. So we would approve this budget as submitted would be our recommendation. Lori, on to Northeastern, slide 45. Northeastern is uh, projecting a negative 9.6% against their budget for 20. And they are requesting a 21 budget that is 3.7% higher than their 20 budget. And this hospital is requesting a, excuse me, this the 3.7% request for NPR is slightly higher than the 3.5% growth ceiling. The hospital is asking for an overall total change in charge of 3.9%. This includes a 2.8% standard change in charge in commercial payer and a 1.1% for COVID, again, in their commercial payer. The hospital justifies um, this uh, budget by they had a volume is being assumed at pre-COVID levels, which would be before um, March or we'll say February. And they emphasize that they have a new infusion drug pass through that is contributing to some of the growth in their NPR, but also it's the growth in their expenses. And they're just passing through the cost through NPR and it's showing up in the expenses. So there's no real revenue for this particular drug. Um, they are returning, having a return of their ophthalmologists and audiologists. They are expanding their express care services so that it doesn't go through their emergency department. And they are trying to um, recruit additional primary care providers. 
And um, like all the other hospitals, they have cut their capital spending costs due to COVID and are putting things on hold. Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, I, I just wanna jump in real quick um, for people following along. Um, you may be looking at the 2.8 standard and 1.1% COVID and, and wondering why that doesn't match some of your materials. Um, Bob Hershey and Sean in their testimony noted that um, with updated projections, they had changed their COVID and standard request. They still want the 3.9%, but as initially submitted to us, it was 2.1% standard and 1.8% COVID. And we went back and forth with Bob yesterday to confirm uh, but what they said in their presentation and their testimony was an updated 2.8% and an updated 1.1%. And I believe board member Holmes was questioning them on, on their, on that change and their, their need still for 3.9%. So we just wanted to highlight that real quick before Lori continues. And Northeastern's um, NPR performance through 20 was uh, not too bad. Of course, like everybody, they were down in their third quarter and they're projecting to rebound in their fourth quarter. And the same thing with their operating margin. Um, but they did have quite a drop in their operating margin in quarter two because of COVID, rebounded a little bit in three because of COVID relief funds, and then expect their fourth quarter to be about 400,000. And this hospital is usually uh, about at their budget, or sometimes it's uh, a little bit higher than their budget since 2015. They are, um, their growth has been about, you know, as you can see, 2.1%, 8% in 19. They are projecting a negative 6.9% growth and then a 14.8% growth for 21. Um, their operating margins, this is a strong, seems to be a strong hospital for operating margins. They've been about the 2% operating margin level, and that's what they're budgeting for for fiscal year 21. And as we noted, Northeastern's change in charge for a total of 3.9%, which is made up of a COVID rate and a standard rate. And um, most of all of that rate is gonna be realized in the commercial payer. So for the standard rate, they're asking for 2.8%. And for COVID, they're asking for a 1.1% COVID change in charge. And the change in charge is um, equal to 1,690,000 um, of their NPR. And this is about 52% of the change in their NPR. This hospital has uh, realized 3.6% five-year average on their approved change in charge rates. And so it's a, they're asking for a little bit more than that for fiscal year 21. Next slide. So Laura, I'm just gonna point out real quick and maybe you have the answer for it and maybe we gotta look into it, but their um, standard change of charge and commercial do not add up to the $1.69 million value. So uh, I think we gotta look into updating some of those numbers. Correct, thank you. Northeastern's um, payer mix, um, has been 45% in 2019 for commercial and it's about 44%. So it's been about the 44% average for um, NPR for commercial and um, between 41 to 39% for Medicare. They have, um, their NPR as a percentage of gross revenue was in 47% in 19 and they're asking for that same percentage in 21. Um, the hospital is requesting a 3.7% growth from their fiscal year 20 budget to their 21 budget. And they wanted to make sure that the board was aware of the infusion drug that is causing the, most of this growth in their NPR to be over the 3.5% growth ceiling. They are asking the 3.9% change in charge, which includes the 1.1% COVID. And we would like, again, this particular hospital to submit timely monthly reports to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, this hospital, like we uh, mentioned about North Country, is collaborating with other hospitals to um, make sure that their area have access to primary care and appropriate specialists. And um, 
as of February 2020, they were operating at about 2% below budget. And also at this time, they had lost their ophthalmologist. The 1.1% COVID related change in charge is worth about $415,000 to NPR. If they did not have this COVID related NPR, they would have 3.3% growth on NPR. And they have been, as I mentioned previously there, consistent historical margin operator. Um, the 3% request as submitted is slightly higher than the 3.6% five-year average. However, this is driven by the, the new infusion drug without which the request would be 2.9% NPR growth. We um, advise the board to submit, um, approve this budget as submitted. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Moving on to Grace Cottage Hospital on slide 51. Uh, their FY21 <coughs> request as submitted represents a 5.3% NPR increase over their FY20 budget. Um, that definitely exceeds the 3.5% growth ceiling set forth by the board. Their requested change in charge is 3.2%. Again, the budget projection variance is, uh, is negative 9%, so it is relatively high compared to um, other more consistent years that hospitals have experienced. Uh, their justifications were that their uh, primary care practices, <clears throat> the new providers have ramped up. They have part-time residents that are moving towards full-time residency in the state, potentially as a result of COVID. And their volumes are assumed to return to pre-COVID levels with no additional growth. Um, again, similar trends here in quarterly activity. Um, overall net patient revenues down, uh, operating margins up, and they are projecting, uh, as of this budget request, a $435,000 positive operating margin, um, which would be the first time in many years that they have produced a, a positive um, margin for the hospital. Um, again, we look back at the history of their performance. Um, below, you can see, as I just alluded to, the um, profitability that they are projecting at the end of that fourth quarter or for that fourth quarter, I should say, I think I misspoke. They are projecting a, a break even, but um, $453,000 in profit for that quarter specifically. Um, <clears throat> we look back at their operating performance here, um, trying to see if they have made their case for a 5.3% 5, 5 uh, growth rate. And we can see from this, from 2015 to 16 to 17 to 18 to 19, there have been some years where they have exceeded that in other years where they haven't. So we went and took a average to kind of smooth that out and their average annual growth from those audited financial statements has been about 4%. Um, as far as the justification around um, part-time residents moving to full residency, um, that's a relatively new phenomenon, I guess I'd say. So that's something that we as staff would wanna see actually play out um, and have a lasting effect on the hospital. And uh, we, we probably would not consider that um, on a one year or even a few months now um, from a few months perspective. So uh, we, we just don't see the hospital growing at 5.4% moving into the next year. Their NPR, um, budgeted NPR of 21 million is well in excess of anything that they've actually put up as you can see in 19, um, $18.7 million in NPR is the highest that they've attained in the history of the hospital. So a jump to uh, in excess of 21 million, uh, we don't find to be um, uh, accurate at this point in time, especially with some of the volatility, um, regardless of COVID, um, even flu season volatility um, could cause an impact to that. <clears throat> um, and again, um, this hospital, as they've stated several times, often does not make any money on margin. Um, where they do make themselves profitable is by the generous um, donations from their community members um, contributing to their total margin. We have not displayed that here, but I think all board members recognize that uh, they have strong community support and um, those dollars they do depend on to uh, contribute to their total margin. So slide 54, the breakdown of their change in charge again, 3.2%, the NPR impact of that is 635,000. 1% of that value is just under 200,000. They will apply their 3.2% across hospital inpatient and outpatient gross charges. 
um, the total combined NPR impact consists of um, $385,000 to Medicare, almost $48,000 to Medicaid, and $202,000 to commercial. And <clears throat> the overall change in charges, the percentage of their NPR increase is almost 60%. Their 3.2% request is well below, uh, a full percentage point below their five-year average of 4.3%. Uh, this is a hospital whose payer mix is, is reportedly operating in the opposite direction from 2019 actuals through this budget in that um, their Medicare percentages are declining at um, rates faster than most of the rest of the system. Medicaid remains stable. And the offset there is that um, commercial portion of their payer mix is actually increasing according to this budget. Um, I see I have a spelling error there. I will make sure I fix that on other. It's not authory, it should be other. Um, Grace Cottage NPR is a percentage of gross revenues. Um, although this chart shows it bouncing up and down is relatively stable around 63%. So the 5.3% request is above the budget to budget growth. We would recommend reducing that rate at average actual growth rate from 2015 to 2019. They may attain 4.3, 4 4.4% this year. They may not, but the story is, as we've seen through our um, collected financial information, it is a 4% growth rate at this hospital. Their change in charge of 3.2%, we would approve as submitted. Again, continued timely submission of financials. Uh, they were, in full transparency, operating about 6.8% below budget as of February. Um, that is a five-month sample size. And we took that in part as far to, part of this consideration. We don't think that's the whole story. Uh, we don't know what their cyclicality uh, is as far as um, revenues from patient care. They are a tourist area, and chances are when they provide budgets in the past, that they are accounting for a um, surge in population in their area and therefore more care, care being delivered uh, from May to September with the influx of folks from out of state. So we took, the fi we took the five months, we discussed it, and we looked back at their actual growth rate of 4%, and we decided that's probably more appropriate uh, for now, even though they were operating at almost 7% below budget. We do acknowledge that. Um, we do not believe that volume will solely contribute uh, to this NPR request. As I said, um, we'd like to see the um, potential change in permanent change in demographics there from part-time residents to full-time. We'd like to see that play out uh, before we acknowledge the potential growth there. Um, <clears throat> uh, and therefore we believe the change in charge should be approved uh, along with the 4% um, NPR FPP growth rate for Grace Cottage. Corey, back to you for Springfield. This will be our last hospital that we will present today. Springfield Hospital, as you're seeing from this slide there, FY20 budget to projection is down, a neg uh, it's down 16.5%. Their requested budget is um, $51.5 million, which is 5.4% higher than their 20 budget. And it is 26.2% higher than their projection. The 5.4% NPR request is higher than the 3.5% ceiling that the board asked for in guidance. The hospital is also asking for a 4% change in charge, which is made up of commercial of 1.1 million, 200,000 for Medicaid, and Medicare is 600,000. The hospital's justification for this is this is a recovery budget and they expect to get back to their volumes pre-COVID and are doing a restructure based on their bankruptcy and hopefully it'll be finalized by the end of this year. They're um, assuming normal volumes as of October 1st and the, the pre-COVID levels are at about 5% increase is what they're expecting. Um, their surgical case is affected by new full-time surgeon. So that helps with their volume. And we heard they have a $9 million expense reduction from 2018 to 2021 budget because of this bankruptcy. They've been working very hard on their cost containment. 
but they also, we know, have expenses for the bankruptcy that has to be absorbed within their budgets. As we presenting, like every other hospital, their quarterly operating performance from the beginning of the year to when COVID hit to what they're expecting for their fourth quarter. And this hospital began at 11.9 million in the first quarter. They're expecting 10.7 million in their fourth quarter. Um, the operating margin, this hospital has been struggling quite a bit. Um, the COVID relief funds helped them dramatically in their quarter three. And, but they're expecting to have a negative operating margin in quarter four of $2.4 million. Next slide, please, 59. Um, this hospital has not, we found, has not been meeting their budget. They've been struggling to meet their budget every year. And um, so that will be shown in our recommendations. They are budgeting um, 51.5 million for their 21 budget, and they're only at 40.8 um, million for their projection 20. Their operating margins have uh, seemed to mostly be in the red for most of these years that we're showing from 2017 through uh, 20 has been negative margins. And then for fiscal year 2021, they're basically trying to break even. Uh, next slide, please. So Springfield is asking for a 4% overall change in charge, which is equal to $1.9 million. And this has a value of shy of $500,000, which is 1% change in charge. They're expecting to increase their hospital inpatient, outpatient, and professional services through the gross revenue of 4%. And they are going to be uh, increasing their payer mix accordingly with the 4% change in charge. Uh, their commercial, Medicaid, and Medicare. So commercial is about $1.1 million, Medicaid is $200,000, and Medicare is $600,000. Um, their change in charge, we found, is about 74% of their increase um, in their budget between 20 and 21. And this hospital has had a 3.9% five-year average of their change in charge from 16 to 20 that the board has approved. Um, in their pair mix, they have been about... 34, 35% for Medicare. They've been up and down a little bit for Medicaid and then uh, up and down for commercial. Right now, it looks like they're trying to be at about 51% of their payer mix is in commercial for 2021. And then they were um, in 2019, and we just received their audited financial statements. 44% of their NPR is... Um, NPR percentage of gross revenue is 44% for 19, and they would like to budget 46% of that for 21. So staff recommend, based on what the hospital is requesting, which is 5.4% um, NPR growth, that is higher than the 3.5% budget guidance. And we recommend that the board accepts the 5% ceiling in guidance as this hospital is already in restructure and is exiting bankruptcy. Um, their 4% change in charge, we are asking that to be approved as submitted. And we emphasize that this hospital should be reporting timely monthly financials to the board and to present their financials and their budget when they exit bankruptcy because they are going to be a different entity. This is our recommendation for the board. Um, everything might change because of bankruptcy. So um, in this hospital as of February 2020 was operating at a 2.7% below budget. They are, like we mentioned, are still in um, bank, Chapter 11 bankruptcy and they plan to exit at the end of this calendar year, so 2020. And um, we think that 
as I mentioned, they are a new organization at that time. So then there might be room for growth or dramatic changes. So we would ask the board to revisit this budget at that time. And we also know that this hospital is planning to separate from the FQHC and um, there might be different expenses or revenues that will be realized at that time. So this hospital is also looking for opportunities to collaborate with other hospitals for services so that they can continue to serve their community. Thank you. And just to, uh, just to piggyback on Lori's point about 3.5%, um, because they are essentially a different organization, especially when we look back at some of the figures here, um, we'd just like to see them try to attain the at least the growth ceiling set forth by the board before NPR goes anything beyond that. Um, because they're different, they've shed their um, they've shed their birthing center. And with that, no doubt, some of the um, the other items that attach to that with pre and postnatal care and pediatrics and stuff will no doubt be have been affected by that. So um, we'd just like to see them um, try to attain 3.5% before we um, look any further beyond that as far as um, an annual NPR growth. So we're bringing that back down um, and setting that mark for this organization that uh, is coming out of bankruptcy, a totally different organization than when they went in. And um, we just like to see those goals be lowered a little bit before um, before going into uh, a little over 5% growth. So let's see what they can do this year. If they come back and they show us that, yes, the growth is actually real, um, then we can have a conversation again at another point in time. But we would just like to see them attain that 3.5%. We think that's pretty generous for a hospital in their situation. Um, but that 4% change in charge, we think, does need to be submitted because this hospital cannot um, cannot deal with another year of uh, seven digit losses. So um, the margin that they need to earn on that is important to them. And with that, Mr. Chair, we conclude our presentation and we welcome um, questions and dialogue by the board. Thank you, Patrick and Lori. Um, I'll start out just by saying, Patrick, that um, on most of the slides, um, you have the, the continued um, timely submission of monthly financials. And I think it might be better if that was just one of the standard conditions. I think there's a new normal now that um, we're not gonna be able to go back to the days where hospitals aren't su submitting on a monthly basis until we achieve some type of normalcy. So um, just stating up front that that would be my preference that it be a standard condition of all budgets, but. Okay, we can do that. Okay, um, board members. Questions or comments? Um, sure, I just have a, a couple. Um, one thing on these slides, um, to the extent we know it, which might not be until next week, but um, if there are COVID funds that are outstand request outstanding, whether that's through FEMA or through the state, um, if we could footnote that, because I know some hospitals we know didn't request, some hospitals we know requested, but we don't know, they weren't sure how much, you know, based on the formula um, that they requested. Um, just a comment um, on your calculation for Grace Cottage on the 4% that you put in there. Um, one thing I would caution on that is I, I think you're, you're mixing apples and oranges, which is, we'll go to that slide for a second right there. So Grace has notoriously missed their budget every year. And the 4% your calculation you're going on is, is based on actual, but then you're applying it to budget. So um, just giving you a forewarning on that, because I'll definitely have a problem on that. I, I would be okay with a 4% off their actual trend, but I wouldn't be okay with a 4% off their budget since in, 19 they missed their budget by you know half a million dollars in 20 they were tracking eight percent off their budget through february and so to put an increase you know again off of budget um 
I think is mixing two things because uh, you were talking their actuals. So I think if we trended their actuals forward, um, that would be a different number, which would probably bring them below the three and a half percent potential. So just just as a comment there. Um, and then like, this question is probably more for uh, for general counsel, for Mike. Um, you know, we know that only four hospitals asked for a COVID increase. And, um, you know, do we have flexibility to bifurcate requests if we want to be, you know, a permanent um, and then a temporary, whether we call it COVID or not? Um, not necessarily for these hospitals, but as we move forward, um, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to. And I, I think it would probably be. Uh, if we went that route, more advantageous from hospitals versus us just cutting a rate, if we decided to put some of it in as a COVID or temporary, we would then be able to revisit that. Um, either we could maybe put it in for six months or for a year or, you know, but we could revisit that. So just a, that's a question to Mike as we're going through and deliberating whether we have the ability to do that. Mike Barber, could you answer that? <laughs> I can try. Um, yes, I think you probably have the uh, ability to to put a COVID rate piece into your approval of a hospital's budget. And I think remembering what the guidance said, I think the guidance was pretty clear that we could revisit those COVID rates mid-year. Um, I guess the the question you guys need to think about is on what basis like um, would you be would be doing that like expenses in FY21 that are related to covid because I think the covid piece was covid rate piece at least was to make up for lost revenue in FY20 I don't so I think we need to just as collectively revisit the, the guidance and and think about think about that a little, but um, yeah, I think you I think you do have the authority to do that. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. Thank you, Maureen. Other board members. I have a couple. Go ahead, Tom. Um, so as of three out of the six, as we went through them, um, half of them received uh, additional revenue from their change in charge from Medicaid. And I, uh, I remember asking that question through one of the hearings, but, um, but I forget the answer. And so, uh, so if DIVA is not increasing their rate, how can a an increase in charge um, generate uh, additional Medicaid revenues? That would be a good question for the hospital who compiled this. <laughs> yeah, for Gifford, it was, for Gifford, it was one hundred ninety thousand, and uh, you know, uh, um, and that was probably their original submission. But um, we know now that DIVA is saying that there will be no um, rate increase except for those that are federally mandated. So that's one. Um, two is I maybe and maybe Kevin or Robin or my fellow board members remember, but during the rate review process, we um, were waiting for hospital budgets to come in. And then uh, because some of the insurers were kind of uh, building into their requests the um, uh, the increases requested by the hospitals and so we ended up kind of uh, finding a um, a line down the middle there where I think I think it was one half the distance between the 2020 increase and the 2021 requests but I forget where that number fell I thought it fell around 3.5 percent. Um, so I'm wondering if, if 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 maybe Mike or somebody can remember w where that number fell that we that we used uh, in in the uh, <clears throat> rate review for MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield. So 
So, Tom, this is Mike. The question is, where did what was the assumption for the unit cost increase in the QHP decisions for for GMCV regulated hospitals? Um, I that that might be it. I I know that that um, the the hospitals the the insurers built in the rate increase requests from the hospitals, and you know I think we all felt that. Well, that was being a little aggressive because we may not approve their rate increase as requested. So we we um, we ended up kind of in the middle of the road, and I I'm just but I can't remember the number that was the middle of the road in terms of an overall average rate increase. Um, we can figure that out later on, but it's just I I I you know I do remember I think I remember it being in the three and a half percent range. Um, no, I think it was greater than that, but it, it was the midpoint between um, what you approved last year and what was submitted this year, which I think was higher than that. But yeah, we can get that number. Yeah, I'd like to know that number because that's that's what we did. And if we're trying to link available commercial out there in the real world, um, um, and it's clear in the rate review process that what we do has a significant impact in terms of the uh, contract negotiations between hospitals and the insurers. It, it'd just be nice to have that as a kind of a background figure. Um, me, my only other one was on grace. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, computer had a brain, a brain cramp when you were presenting grace. <laughs> I couldn't see the slide. So I'm trying, I was trying to, you know, uh, but uh, my computer just got overloaded here. So, um, for, so the 20, 2021 budget, um, as I recall, Grace had did very well with the, the, the CARES grants and the COVID money, and that allowed them to have quite a bit of carry forward into 2021. And I'm just wondering, you know, if how much one-time money is built into Grace's budget um, or revenue expectations based on carry forward. Uh, of, of CARES money and that, uh, you know, when it's gone, it's gone. Um, I, I just, I'm always concerned about one-time money kind of getting getting uh, an entity through the day, but then uh, in, the, in the day after the day, um, they're out there, uh, uh, you know, you know w with weakness in, in, <clears throat> in their budget. Yes, so I've put up the, um, system-wide COVID-19 funds reported another operating revenue. And it looks like, you're right, they did. They received a lot more cash than they have the ability to use at this time. Uh, but they are budgeting for realization of about $882,000 or $882, of those funds in other operating revenue in their 2021 budget. Right. I, don't believe from what they said that that is the total amount they have left. I think they have concerns that they will be giving some of that back because they have not been impacted by uh, the pandemic in the way that other hospitals have. Most hospitals, as we stated, have either exhausted those funds already or will by the end of this fiscal year. And I think North Country was one of them who has about $2.5 million left, but they didn't budget for using any of it because they're not positive they're going to be able to um, use any of those funds. So what we have is on the screen in front of us on slide 12 is about $882,400 for grace that will um, that is built into that 2021 budget in other operating area. So what that means is that when they move into 2022, that one time money is gone. And I'm just wondering how much we want to think about that uh, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, getting through 2021, but uh, 2022, it, it, it becomes a big hole. Because that's, that's a significant part of Grace's budget. That yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the terms of the CARES Act stimulus funds are. If they have to be used by the end of this calendar year, that rings a bell, but I'm not positive. So um, that's we'll, right, we'll, Patrick. That, okay, so that is right. So Tom, this hundred eight hundred eighty two thousand four hundred dollars they would be planning to exhaust in the first quarter of their fiscal year twenty twenty one budget if they are to use it or lose it by the end of calendar year. Thank you for that. Those, sure. those, those, those are my questions.
This is Robin. Um, I just had a uh, one question in terms, just in follow up on Maureen's uh, comment about grace and the 4% off actuals. Could we get that sort of calculated um, so that when we're talking about it, we can actually see the numbers and what that would look like? Yes, we sure. can do that. Um, I think I'm going to look back over my notes, but I think that was my one additional thought. Um, so Jessica here, um, lots to think about. I really appreciate all of the hard work that the team did in compiling all this data, making it an easy to see format, um, and giving thought to recommendations for us for this year. I think this is going to be a tough year. And so the more inputs we have into our decision making, the better. So I really appreciate all the time and effort you all did. Um, I had the same grace question. Um, so that's been asked twice. That's great. And the only other, um, comment I was going to make is for the hospitals where you're recommending NPR reductions, I wondered whether the motion language should make explicit that hospitals should make commensurate reductions in expenses. We assume that they would, but to the degree that we're cutting their NPR, um, should there be some comment about expectations around expenses? Otherwise, we're going to, you know, have some operating margin concerns. So just wanted to throw that out there for comment conversation. That, Jess, that is definitely what we used to do in the past. Thank you. Okay. Yep. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment on all the slides that have been presented so far and on the hospital budget process to date. So um, as Susan stated at the beginning of the meeting, um, you can put in um, written public comments through next Tuesday. And at this point, uh, we will hear any uh, verbal public comments that anyone wishes to make. Kevin, this is Ham. I've got one. Go ahead, Ham. Uh, and for the really... record, that's Hamilton Davis, Kim. Yes, I'm sorry. The, uh, Kevin, should I go? Yes. Okay. The um, uh, Kevin, the the, the um, uh, this whole, uh, especially the top of it, not the individual hospitals. Um, it's terrific performance. It just sort of wreaks confidence by your Patrick Rooney and Laurie and her their team. Um, on the other hand, I think I, I think it would be that that Patrick might consider the following: the um, the this uh, blizzard of numbers um, uh, can be cut all kinds of ways, and it it serves the needs of the board who, who are as expert, or nearly as expert, or maybe more expert, on the issues and all the ins and outs and the nuances as the, as the financial staff. What, what I would think it might be worthwhile to to um, to consider forget about the board for a minute and to ask Patrick to put together one slide, just one slide with the with the uh, with the actual numbers that you, that you believe that he believes or the board believe defines the performance of the system. If you don't do that, what happens is that you get all kind of freelancing from outside the about the numbers. And if you don't think you, you don't see that, you've got right now, you've got the, the uh, state auditor saying that your whole board isn't doing any kind of a decent job and they're just adventuring around with the numbers. And so I think if you can, if you can put out just one slide, uh, just, just one, you can put 150 or whatever, take one slide and say, okay, this is the system. And you get NPR, for instance, you've got, you've got NPR with, um, Perspective payment and NPR without. Okay, what really counts? What really counts is what this is the total spending, and that is net patient revenue uh, in, or, and, or, for, for fee for service and the total amount of spending for FPP. So take the num the real num the real numbers. How much money? Okay, from one year to the next, uh, or for two years. I think that the uh, Maureen's idea was really good. Okay, so what you have is you have three or four or five numbers max, okay, 
that define the performance of the overall system. Here's a way to think of it. It's one thing, it's gonna take somebody, even somebody pretty good, it would take them five or six hours of really studying all these numbers that they just see for the first time in order to write a piece of a, a text that would explain to an, a non-expert what was happening. Think of an, an, an associated press recorder in the old day when they used to be real recorders that that is going to have is going to have to go to your meeting come out of your meeting and produce a piece that gets the top of it right in 10 minutes okay you cannot do that unless you get a unless somebody like a heavy duty uh, industrial strength uh, finance guy like patrick or laura that can say okay there's, there's, there's seven thousand numbers here but here's the five you really need to know that's my comment thank you Thank you, Ham. Other members of the public? Okay, we have a lot to uh, think about board. And um, before we um, end for today, we have uh, uh, several items that, of uh, business that we have to take care of. The first item being the um, minutes of uh, Wednesday, August 5th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, August 5th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The next item I'm going to call on General Counsel Michael Barber to announce a um, Rate decision, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on August 28th, 2020, uh, the board approved the Association Health Plan uh, rating program filing of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, it's a bit, uh, there's no rate increase that I can announce because there is no approved rate um, for these products. Um, it's a, a formula and factor filing, um, so there's no premium to announce either, but the board uh, made several modifications, um, adjusted the FY 2021 unit cost assumptions for GMCB regulated facilities, um, which as I was telling Tom for the QHP uh, to the midpoint between last year's approved hospital budget rates and this year's submitted hospital budget rates, uh, reduced the trend component of the administrative charge increase to zero, um, corrected the administrative charges to remove uh, TBHP billback amounts included in the base period, and um, uh, used updated unit cost trend calculations, which removed an immaterial formula error. Um, so it's don't have a rate to announce, but that was the board's decision. Thank you, Mike. Um, Susan, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. And could you just update the public? Because I think uh, people expected us to have a meeting this afternoon at two. Um, with uh, Secretary Smith, and you could update on uh, when that is going to occur. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we uh, will not have our meeting this afternoon. We were expecting to hear from Secretary Smith um, some updates on the COVID relief funding. Um, they need some more time to process those applications. And uh, we have uh, rescheduled that meeting. So Secretary Smith will be here virtually <laughs> in our meeting next uh, Wednesday, September 9th at 1 p.m. to give us an update on those uh, funding applications to the hospitals. Thank you, Susan. Is there other old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Oh, I just have a question on, um, I know our meeting next Wednesday starts at 8.30. Um, and Secretary Smith, I guess they couldn't come in the morning. Is that true, Susan? So they won't be here till one. 
right that's right the, you know we're kind of waiting for some of right. that information as we go through the hospitals but yes that's right thank you maureen maureen are you um suggesting that we uh start that meeting at one instead of 8 30. Oh, I guess we'd probably just have to go through the same thing with other hospitals with the recommendation piece, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to entertain approvals and things like that until we know until we know that piece. So So I'm not opposed to uh, need the time, so I would say still we should still probably meet in the morning, but Okay. Okay. Is there any any other new business to come before the board. Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone.